Hey friends, what's going on? It's Mike from Go Cell Phone Repair for the Monday Afternoon Tech Hangout. This is where we go over some of the technology happenings in the news and other areas of our life and uh, just kind of hang out. It's very casual. Some of the things that we'll be talking about will be the FCC approving rules that may give Google Fiber and others faster access to utility poles. Galaxy Note 9 leaks, and pretty much everything about the Galaxy Note 9, it looks like, has leaked so far, so I don't know what else there is to know about this phone. Google shares the Pixel 3 release date with YouTubers, so what that means is that we all have the Google Pixel 3 release date, of course. A virus halts TSMC's production of iPhone chips, but it says it was not caused by a hacker, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. And a 3D gun designer, says social costs are necessary to protect the Second Amendment, and China's high-tech bird drones used by the military and government to watch citizens. That's what the article says. Anyways, all right, let's talk tech. Dave, Dave, relaxing after a long Monday. Good for you, man. Good to see you guys here. Greg M., hello. Nate, glad you could all join us today. And uh, there are some... Just briefly, I want to go over this one because there are two things that I've been following closely here. And one of those is right to repair and the other is net neutrality. You guys who have been on the, you know, watching the broadcast or the um, live stream for a while already know that. These are two things at the top of my list uh, for, for a couple different reasons. You know, the implications are important to me for what I do as in for a living you know what i do as an occupation i rely on an internet connection and i rely on the ability to have access to parts and tools needed to repair electronic devices so of course these things are important to me a lot of other people may care less but i think if you use the internet at all especially broadband you should definitely be concerned about net neutrality and the fact that it went away and also the interests of large ISPs who would prefer that they have control over your network connection and that they don't have any competition. This is a real problem here. You know, at least most Americans, I think, hold these ideals to be important, that we should allow competition in the marketplace. We shouldn't just have one company that does it all and that's the only place that you can go to get whatever that product is and they should not be able to block other people from entering the market because they've gotten so big and they have so much power and control, they can pretty much squash you if you're one of the little guys. So that's one of the reasons that I believe that this is important, you know, along with the whole net neutrality debate. We, we need to encourage competition. This is what increases the level of quality and value that we get as consumers. Once somebody has the market cornered, they sell it to you for the price that they want to, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So uh, this is really a surprise though, because this is coming from the FCC. And as you know, they recently uh, struck down net neutrality and Ajit Pai has, as far as we can tell, sold out to these big companies for lobbying dollars. But this is kind of an exception to the rule. Now there is something called, there is something called one touch make ready. And what this means is that, let's say you wanna open up a, an internet service providing service, or you want to open up a cable service. So you want something else that gets into people's houses and has to have a hard line connection. Well, obviously we have telephone poles all over the place in, in most areas, not everywhere. Some are a little more modern than that. But having access to that pole often will mean that you have to go through the company that is currently using it or the person who built it, you know, if it's a private company. And for a lot of reasons, what has been happening is people have been saying, hey, we want to lay some, some wire here, some fiber, whatever the connection is. And it seems that historically the people who own the poles have pretty much just dragged their feet as much as they possibly can. Not really been as cooperative as they should be with these other companies who are saying, hey, we need access to these poles in order to install these lines. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll get to it when we have time. Well, the FCC, whoops, let's get this off. The FCC approved new rules that could let Google Fiber and other new internet service providers gain faster access to utility poles. The one-touch make-ready rules will let companies attach wires to utility poles without waiting for the other users of the pole to move their wires out of the way. So yes, on the surface, it sounds like a good thing. And of course, the first thing you think of is, well, hold on a second. That means 
that instead of going through this established setup, they're gonna say, well, we get to access the pole and the wire, move this stuff out of the way and put our stuff where we need to. So there is obviously a potential for problems there. And while I think that that's the negative side, and I've actually experienced this here in my own home where I had a high-speed connection and then someone down the street had a service installed and whoever the installer was that was messing around uh, close to the node or wherever the service comes to my house screwed things up and my internet speed went down to almost zero because they didn't know what they were doing. So yes, we should make sure that people are qualified to make these sorts of installations. And, you know, ideally we should, we would have cooperation between these companies, but there are obvious reasons why some would be less likely to go along with anything that would infringe on their, you know, ability to sell their service, right? So there's a good and there's a bad to this. And ultimately, I think what it comes down to is that had they been more cooperative, we wouldn't have had this order, this court order that says that they don't have to wait for you to move your stuff out of the way. So if anyone caused a problem, I, I think part of the blame at least lies on the companies who were not going along with this in the first place. The surprising thing here is that Ajit Pai says that startups are unnecessarily delayed when they have to wait for incumbent ISPs to hang wires, which is shocker, right? Coming from this guy, did he have a change of heart? Is this to kind of dig himself out, you know, clear up his reputation, so to speak? I don't know. I'm still very suspicious about his motivations. And this is a quote from him. For a competitive entrant, especially a small company, breaking into the market can be hard, if not impossible, if your business plan relies on other entities to make room for you on those poles. Duh. Uh, today, a broadband provider that wants to attach fiber or other equipment to a pole first must wait for and pay for each existing attacher to sequentially move existing equipment and wires. This can take months and the bill for multiple truck rolls adds up. For companies of any size, pole attachment problems represent one of the biggest barriers to broadband deployment. So makes a lot of sense what he's saying there. I question his motivation because again, if you did something that made us distrust you in the past, then you're gonna have to go the extra mile to kind of you know, change people's opinion of you. And really this doesn't erase the actions that you took last year when you helped to repeal net neutrality. So I don't think he's out of hot water, but um, I guess a gesture in the right direction here. Now the one touch made ready. Uh, one thing about this is interesting is that carriers do plan to place cells on utility poles as they upgrade from 4G to 5G. So is there someone else behind the scene saying, we need this so that Verizon and AT&T and uh, you know, T-Mobile and all the carriers can benefit and are they the ones in fact who are influencing these decisions to allow you know, what looks like would be a good thing for the public to us? I don't know. You know. Ultimately, we do want to have access to this for everyone. We don't wanna build an entire new set of telephone poles and for this reason, I believe it makes sense for us to have regulations in these areas. We don't want everyone to build up their own network with you know, extra stuff when they could be attaching it to an existing tower, to an existing pole, co-locating co co on similar locations. So it, it seems like a good move. I, I gotta say that the thing that struck me the most, back between 98 and 2008, I was living in Las Vegas. And when I moved to the Bay Area, the thing that blew my mind was seeing all these telephone poles again. Because if you live in an area that is recently developed, there aren't telephone poles. Everything's underground. They've got fiber laid all over the place. You don't have to worry about it. And it's it's interesting that you go into older neighborhoods and you know cities that have been around for a long time and people talk about making everything look good and keeping it clean and the skyline and this and that. And yet there are telephone poles all over the place, no matter where you look. And the wires generally don't look nice and neat like they were installed recently. It's really kind of a mess. So, you know, we definitely don't want to duplicate that. We don't want more stuff just being added and blocking the scenery and, and causing us to have construction projects where they have to go onto your property to put these poles in. So this makes a, a lot of sense, I think. Um, and also there's an interesting part here and they said that the, F the FCC changes won't resolve or won't solve the problem of slow deployment everywhere. This 
new rule only applies to privately owned polls. So anything that is owned by a municipality or a cooperative, we would assume that they're not having this problem in the first place. I don't know that for, for a fact, but that would make a lot of sense that, oops, sorry about bumping the camera there. Uh, so hopefully this will solve some problems. We'll have to wait and see what happens here. A shortened version of the old process will apply to attachments that are complex, meaning that they are likely to cause outages or damages. A shortened version of the old process will also apply on the parts, excuse me, on the upper parts of a pole where high voltage electrical equipment is kept. So we certainly want to make sure this whole process is safe and they're saying that there is an exemption. These are only for simple attachments where they don't have to get involved in anything that could be uh, potentially dangerous. Previously, existing poll users had to perform make ready work within 60 days or within 90 days for work on the upper parts of the poll. Those timelines are being shortened to 30 and 60 days. And lastly, despite today's vote, the FCC hurt the cause of faster poll attachment when it deregulated the broadband industry last year. Yeah, we knew that. Uh, no thanks for that one. And then we go on here to talk about a few different things uh, regarding net neutrality and a test in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where it is a coastal community. There are laws that limit the ability of private entities to dig up roads during certain times of year, namely during the height of hurricane season and during peak tourist time. So obviously we would want to have some guidelines that go along with this. You don't want just people going out and doing construction again, where, where there's a potential for hazards to take place. But altogether, I believe that this is a good thing. And, you know, obviously it'll be some time before we see what the effects are, but hopefully we're moving in the right direction on this. Let's get this over here. Uh, Greg said, the thing is with underground installations is that carriers such as Verizon refuse to repair their landline phones when they are underground due to higher labor costs. Interesting, I haven't thought about that, Greg. I, I always wonder, how much the landline market has been, you know, diminished over time. When we talk about residential, obviously in businesses, most or a lot of businesses have landlines. Quite a few have switched over to voice over IP, of course. But uh, that's an interesting point. So they don't want to dig up the lines in the ground. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and interestingly enough, when I had my cable installed here, the guy went out in, outside and said that the lines that were coming into the house were too old. In other words, they had been installed at a time where broadband wasn't even really a thing. So they did not have the capability and they have this dual coax wire. It's got like one big coax and one small coax kind of side by side with it. Definitely not an expert in that area. And they had to go and run the entire line from my house across several neighbor's yards up to the pole. And we've got this big sloping um this big line just like going over everybody's backyards and it gets into the trees and then of course the question is whose job is it to maintain the trees so that they don't interfere with the lines is it the company that owns the power lines and the communication lines because if so then they have to come with the cherry picker and you know go over your yard and trim that stuff down and as we found in during the napa fires uh, according to a lot of the stories or the uh, what they think happened is that the utility company did not go in and trim these trees and they were coming into contact with these power lines. So obviously uh, concerns on either type of technology there. They wanna push those customers over to VoIP and charge them more for their service. And I, that makes sense. I mean, that's what they do, right? Would not surprise me. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's get through this here because I was, gonna, I was gonna try to get through these stories and then leave us plenty of time to discuss this and much more. Here the telcos still use twisted pair and they corrode. Wow, no kidding. The telco <clears throat> on their dime ran a fiber connection to the basement here to eventually solve that issue. That's interesting. I was around in the days of twisted pair and talking to customers when I was with Lucent. Uh, when Lucent Technologies was a company, I'm not sure if they're even around anymore. And we were still selling, um, actually we were selling newer stuff than that, but they, we still went through the training and talked about twisted pair wires and all that stuff. Fun times, old school. All right, so the Galaxy Note 9 leak probably relieved every last de detail. And they're not really, they're not really doing a buildup where there's anything I don't think that's gonna surprise anyone. And I always question 
Whether these are intentional or not, I suspect no. I think that a lot of the leaks that come out, even though we have companies like Apple threatening people over leaking information, you know, I really wonder how much of this is leaked and how much of it is intentional. But uh, with that being said, it looks like a lot of what we're expecting from the Galaxy Note 9 is already out there. There are plenty of links actually in this article. And I'm going to have to go back and add the links down in the video description. I meant to do that before the video started. So those will be up within the next couple of hours. But here's what we know according to a leak. So this is, uh, who is this? This is Reddit user WAN997, or WAN997, WAN I don't know, posted a thread in the Android subreddit on Sunday claiming to have uncovered new information about the Galaxy Note 9. Did I say S9 earlier? Galaxy Note 9. He claims to be very close with a Samsung national trainer, and he has in the past claimed to work in retail. I'm not sure what... Uh, why that would make any difference. And he posted accurate information about the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus earlier this year before they were announced. That would be the thing that would make me more likely to believe what he's saying about this handset. So according to his post on Reddit, the pre-order for the Galaxy Note 9 comes with either a wireless AKG noise-canceling headphones, a pair, say a pair of noise-canceling wireless AKG headphones that retail for $299 or Fortnite gaming package. So I don't know what's in the Fortnite gaming package exactly. We'd probably have to look that up. But you can also opt for both of the above if you want to pay an extra $99. So you'll get a $300 pair of headphones, a Fortnite gaming package, whatever that was worth, which we would kind of assume would be somewhere around that same price point. I would think if it's either or, they're probably both worth or retail for around $299, just my guess. But you can pay an extra 100 bucks and get both. So if that's your thing, certainly seems like it would be a deal. The Galaxy S Pens are supposed to be sold separately so that you can pick different colors. And 40 seconds of S Pen charging gives you 30 minutes of use. Would be great if they could do that with the phone also. Uh, the, the S Pen shutter button mechanic lets you double tap the button to flip camera mode. Okay, so, alrighty. So I guess I would assume this kind of works like a remote for your camera. You double click, or you double tap the button on the S Pen to flip ca camera mode. I'm a little confused as to whether they're talking about clicking a button on the S Pen or using the S Pen to click a button on the phone. I would hope that it's the former and not the latter because that would be cool to have be able to switch your phone without having to tap on the screen. And I still think that Siri and OK Google and all these other all these other voice assistants should be able to snap a picture. That would be like one of the most useful things I can think of. You tell your camera to start recording or you tell your camera to snap a picture and it does. That that just seems like an obvious one and yet uh, my my phone certainly doesn't do that. 6.4 inch screen but or is it the screen or the entire phone? It looks like 6.4 inch screen, but very similar footprint as the Note 8, as he says, it fits in his Note 8 case. So uh, this appears to be the latest. And again, there is a full thread here, and I'll post these later on where they talk about all of the other details regarding the Galaxy Note 9, which is at this point, it looks like everything there is to know about it. So I I'm not sure how much excitement there is about the Galaxy Note 9 at the moment. And in general, it does seem a bit as if handsets across the board aren't, you know, I, I hate to say this, but with exception of the, the new Huawei phones that they're talking about, I'm wondering if we're going to see anything this year that just blows people's minds and says, this is true innovation. This is the most amazing thing. There is some huge change that a manufacturer has made for the rest of 2018 that really gets people excited in the U.S. And obviously, I speak for... America, because this is where I'm at. I'm sure in other parts of the world, things are different. If you're in Europe and or Asia, maybe even Canada, you have access to things that we don't have here. So um, it's looking more and more like we get what they tell us we get, uh, which means Samsung or Apple. So hopefully someone else gets into the game there. But for now, I, I don't know that, uh, I, I certainly haven't heard a lot of people getting excited or talking about the Galaxy Note 9. Who knows, maybe it will be the next big thing uh, let's talk about this real quick here. We have Google who told YouTubers. So there is in a platform called FameBit. 
I've actually been on here before and I've, I've had some sponsors approach me about their products and some of them I've done reviews for and some I haven't because it really depends on the product, whether it's appropriate for my channel and if it's a good product or not, obviously. So uh, what happens is this fame bit is kind of a connecting point between YouTube creators and sponsors who want to have their product reviewed on a channel. They'll go on to FameBit and look for what your channel is, what's it about, and then decide if they think that you're, um, you're a good fit. And you can also approach them and say, hey, I like your product. I'd like to feature it on my channel. Here's what it's going to cost you and so forth. So according to this article, this is on Business Insider, Google posted the announcement date for its upcoming Pixel 3 smartphones on FameBit, which apparently is owned by Google. I didn't know that. And here's what they're saying. Google Pixel 3 and Pixel 3 XL smartphones will be revealed on October 4th. So there's your launch date. According to information, the company posted itself on one of its own websites. And I have to wonder here also as to whether this was not intentional because it doesn't seem like something that Google would do by mistake. That That's generally not their style. Uh, Google's own posting shows the company is specifically looking for Canadian content creators who aren't currently using Pixel smartphones but are willing to switch to the Pixel 3. So Canadian um, phone users, here's your chance. Jump on FameBit and maybe Google will have you review their Pixel 3. I'm not in Canada, so I can't do that. And here's what they're saying. Uh, you can earn up to $10,000. I mean, this guy posted the screenshot from his account. I don't know if that is in conflict with their terms and conditions. I've never really dug that deep into it, but I always assumed that Google generally, or at least historically, wasn't too happy about people sharing their statistics. I was told at one point that when it comes to things like AdSense and YouTube stats, you're not supposed to share that stuff, but then we see people doing it all the time. So I don't know if that is cha has changed, but here they're saying, earn up to $10,000 and you can hopefully clearly see, I know it's a little tough probably on, a, if, especially if you have a smaller screen, but under where it says about the brand, the Pixel 3 phone is launching October 4th, 2018, looking for uh, Canadian creators only. And that's about it. There's not a lot in the way of details as far as specs. And from what we have heard, the images that have been released for the Pixel 3 are probably just images of the Pixel 2 or doctored images of the Pixel 2 with guesses as to what the new thing's gonna look like. So we don't really know for sure. I don't think there's a whole lot here outside of that. The device pictured on the listing on FameBit looks like the original Pixel's design and it's very much unlikely to show the actual, pic actual Pixel 3 design. So this is probably not what the Pixel 3, well, who knows, maybe it'll look the same and just be faster. That would, it could do just like, uh, just like Apple, just make the same phone again, but with better specs. For this campaign, blah, 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 we already talked about that. If you're looking to see what the Pixel 3 XL will look like, several photos have leaked already. I would be skeptical as to whether or not they are legitimate. Either way, it looks like three of the biggest tech, tech companies on earth are carelessly leaking information. See, it says it on the article, and that's the way I've always kind of looked at this. All over the internet, including the Note 9, even Apple leaving hints about its future iPhones and blah, 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 and so on. So yeah, not a, not a big surprise there, but this, this is the picture that they have on the FameBit website. And it looks like it's just a Pixel 2, honestly. Uh, yeah, Greg, you're in Canada, man. I was going to say, hit him up. See if you can get the, get a hold of one of these. Nate, yeah, Nate, if you have a Canadian address, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. America, yeah. Up to uh, 10G and down to what? And down to zero. Yeah, exactly. Well, the interesting thing about this, I'll tell you if you're curious. The way that FameBit works is they will post something like this. I, I think it's interesting. If you want to be on YouTube or you're thinking about making a YouTube channel, if you go to YouTube, if you go to YouTube, if you go to FameBit and you have an account, and here's the downside. You have to have a minimum of 5,000 subscribers to get onto this onto this platform. I don't know why. That's, that's their criteria. And it says up to $10,000. So what will happen is you can write a message to whatever company it is that says, hey, we have this, this product and we're paying up to, uh, just like you said, and then you get to approach them and say, well, hey, I will do it for X amount of dollars and then they can respond back. And I would imagine that they're allowed to counter offer in some way until you can negotiate a price. So I don't think that there would be a lot of people who would qualify for a $10,000 payment for 
demoing the Google Pixel 3. Maybe if you had a few million subscribers, probably our friend Marcus or Marquise. I never know how to pronounce his name, but you know, M-K-G-H-B-T, Elemental P. I, I, I literally don't know what his... Um, what his letters are, but you know who I'm talking about. Marquise Brownlee, he does all of the reviews of everything, does amazing camera work. If he said, I'll take 10,000 for this, I'm sure they would give it to him, no problem. Me, probably not. I'll make it $10, maybe a couple hundred, I don't know. <laughs> Goes outside, looks for airdrop of Pixel 3, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's it for the phone stuff, really, uh, this week. Pixel 3, Galaxy Note 9, other than that, as far as things that we have access to in North America. That's most of the excitement. Uh, now, in addition to that, here's something interesting to think about. Uh, computer virus cripples iPhone chip maker TSMC. This was from August 4th. So it's been a couple days. I would assume that things are back to business as usual, but a computer virus halted several Taiwan's, uh, I'm sorry, several Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company TSMC, otherwise known as Factories Friday Night, dealing the company one of its most severe disruptions as it ramps up chip making for Apple Inc.'s next iPhone. So we're talking about the company who has the exclusive manufacturing for the uh, processor for Apple's phones. So when the next iPhone comes out, this is where the chip is coming from. And we talked recently about how Apple is thinking about installing two different types of chipsets for their baseband, I believe it is, on upcoming iPhones. I hope I'm right on that. I'll have to go check it. But uh, they were looking at two different manufacturers. One of them was Qualcomm and the other was, was it Intel? In any case, most people felt like one of these manufacturers was superior to the other. So looking at this, uh, let, let me finish reading this part here. The sole maker of the iPhone's main processor said a number of its fabrication tools had been infected, and while it had contained the problem and resume, resumed some production, several of its factories won't restart until at least Sunday. Again, they've probably started by now. The virus wasn't introduced by a hacker, the company added in a statement. I don't understand what that means, first of all. The company says there's a virus in their system but it wasn't caused by a hacker. So what would that mean? That they intentionally introduced this virus? Because depending on your definition of hacker, that would mean that would seem to me like they're saying that this was from inside the company somewhere because hacking, at least in my mind, would say that someone from outside found a way to get into their network and installed this virus onto their equipment. And if that's not the case, that means that someone on the inside must have done it, I assume. It's unclear who targeted S TSMC. So if you know that it wasn't a hacker, but it's unclear who you were targeted by, those two statements together, I, I'm not sure I understand. So uh, maybe we'll get some more information about this later on. But my curiosity here is that anytime you're buying something like, let's say screens, you know, for the longest time Apple has, or, or at least for the last year, buying a lot of hardware from Samsung and definitely buying OLED screens from Samsung because they were pretty much the only place to go for that. And Apple decided that they didn't want to be dependent on one single company, especially not one that is a competitor. So when it comes to things like processors, if you are always buying from one source and something happens to that source or they decide that they want to make more money or not do business with you anymore, you're kind of stuck. I mean, you'd have to look for an alternative and, and especially when you're getting close to a release date like we are now, you would kind of think that it would make a lot of sense to have something to fall back on, a plan B, so to speak, right? Like if we buy from this manufacturer and that manufacturer, if there's a problem with one or we get a batch you know, of defective materials, we can always pull from the other one. And at the same time, we'll probably have people come out and say, well, I don't want a chip, you know, a processor on my phone that was made by another company because TSMC is the standard. They're the best ones out there. So there are two sides to that story, but it's interesting that this happened so close to the release of the next iPhone and just kind of a, an indication that of what the future looks like, you know, we, we get into this stuff about Russian hacking and, and, you know, all sorts of people who are, who are manipulating things, using technology, using the internet, using Facebook, you know, all these different 
possibilities it can happen and how cybercrime is becoming such a huge concern and such a big thing that you would have to imagine we will see more and more of this happening in the future because one, there's always the ability to extort money from someone by using this type of technology and not to mention foreign interest and manipulating elections and the public opinion and so forth. So it's not a huge surprise, I don't think. And eventually you've got to imagine that someone's competitor is going to say, hey, we know a guy who can shut this company down. He knows how to get into the system and introduce viruses and, and cause the equipment to stop working. And while we're looking at companies that we've been told not to buy from, like Huawei and ZTE and other manufacturers, because there's a potential for them to build in spyware and backdoors into their phones. Well, how about this? This, <laughs> which side am I on here? Okay, how about this right here? How about when a company that manufactures a phone that we are in, you know, almost encouraged or, or in a manufacturer we are encouraged to buy from gets hacked by someone on the outside, then we're kind of in the same situation almost. You, you know, the concern before was that maybe, maybe they're building these Huawei phones with backdoors already installed and spyware already in them so that they can keep track of, I don't know, who you call on your phone and who you text or, or whatever it is that they would be interested in. But no matter who makes the phone, there's always a potential for that malware to be installed. We know this. I mean, if anyone out there has never had a virus on their computer, I'd like, I'd like to meet you. So, uh, I don't know. It's starting to feel like we're living in a sci-fi movie here. It's unclear how the lost days of output would affect the, the Taiwanese firm, the latest to fall prey to a growing scourge. Uh -huh. The implications are also unclear for Apple. So we'll probably hear more about this in the news. Maybe, probably, maybe. Certain factories return to normal in a short period of time, and we expect the others to return in one day. That's all I have. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, getting back to the reviewers, let's see. Go outside, looks for job. Oh, problem with reviewers is that you are not being impartial and critical of a product if you are behold, beholden to the company for future product, for review, and money. I don't hold anything back on crappy products. And I'm going to, I mean, I agree with you on that, Greg, for the most part you'll find that there are publishers and, you know, even even major media outlets that, I mean, take a look at something on TV. People can't go on and talk about a brand. They cannot endorse it, nor, they can, nor can they criticize it with rare exception because there's a potential that one of those brands is sponsoring their program. And for that reason, when whenever one of these companies approaches me and says, hey, will you review this product on your channel? I certainly let them know in no uncertain terms that I'm going to discuss every positive and negative of their product, and and I remind them that you know negative con you know negative reviews of a product are not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes somebody watches a review where people are complaining about it and talking about how terrible it is, but they still end up buying the product. And obviously, that is not going to be as often as if there is a positive endorsement. But I certainly wouldn't. It, I wouldn't expect you guys or anyone else to give credibility to my channel if I came on here and started just um, sugarcoating my reviews, you know, and saying, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. But I absolutely agree with you. There are a lot of people who are afraid to do just that. They're afraid to be honest because they don't think they'll get that advertising opportunity in the future. Um, and in many cases, I've had to turn companies down because they send they send me garbage and they say, will you review this? And I tell them exactly what the review is going to look like. And in some cases, they say, okay, we're just going to pass, you know, because it's going to make them look bad. And I don't want to make videos that make products look bad. So, you know, and it, people probably watch this and go, oh, yeah, sure, sure you don't. But honestly, I, I could show you how many products I've looked at and just said it would be better for me not to review this because I'm going to tell people how much it sucks. And uh, maybe some at some point, so one of these companies will say, that's okay, go ahead and do it. We want to see that review anyways, but so far, not too many. So uh, I even had somebody hounding me because I left them, I left them a review of four stars instead of five and and. They're like, why didn't you give us five stars? You know, what's the problem with the product? I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with your product, but what really, what really justifies a five-star review? I mean, in my mind, that is less believable and less legitimate than three or four-star reviews. I mean, if I see a one-star review 
or a five-star review if it's one out of five stars. I wouldn't believe either of those extremes. There's just too much. Nothing is perfect and nothing is so terrible that you took time to review it but only gave it one star. That To me, that doesn't make any sense. Especially when make, people make comments like, if I could have left zero stars, I would have. Well, don't leave a review then. That seems like it would be you know, the thing to do because anytime you leave a review, you are generating content for someone's product, whether you like it or not. So I don't know, that's just my, that's just the way I think of it. Um, thing is, it is hard to do a review if you only had a product for two days. That is not a review. A review is a week or a month using the product. I agree completely and it's crazy how often people send a product and ask you two days later if your review is ready. And I'm like, no, I need some time to, to work with it. So point taken, I, I'm with you on that one for sure. Okay, so I did not, I am not gonna put this in the video description because it appears as if on YouTube you don't want to use the word gun in your title, description, tags, anything along those lines. I can't even put heat gun, which you know we use for heating things up. I can't put that in my video description because it will be a controversial tag. And who knows, maybe this, maybe this will become a controversial video and it'll be demonetized, whatever. I think that when you reach the point where you can't discuss something, you know, there really should be nothing that's taboo to discuss. I, I can see I can see people being opposed to promoting something. You know, this is a bad thing. We don't want to promote it. But if it's happening, saying that you can't discuss it to me is just ridiculous. You know, uh, either side that you may be on. And I, I try to stay neutral on these things because they're so controversial. But I think telling people not to talk about things is kind of silly. Uh, it's juvenile. So the man behind the 3D printed gun design says, social costs are necessary to protect the Second Amendment. If you haven't already heard about this, there are 3D guns that you can print and you can apparently download them from somewhere online. I don't know where. Uh, I don't have a 3D printer, so it wouldn't really do me a whole lot of good. And the whole thing was that right before these 3D gun plans or, or whatever it is that they are used in order to make this happen, before they were, were released, there was a judge, I want to say, who came in and said, you shouldn't do that, <laughs> you know, for obvious reasons. That, that means that anyone can have a gun, no license involved, no record of the transaction, no idea who has it and so forth. So that is the argument. Uh, now, the founder of an organization that publishes, let's see, this is Cody Wilson. He is the founder of Defense Distributed, and they published designs for 3D printable, printable guns online, said Sunday that he's willing to accept the social costs that come with his products in the name of defending the Second Amendment. Now, one interesting thing about that statement, and uh, two interesting things about that statement, I'll probably come up with more in a second. One of them being, it's interesting to see how many people in this country will pick and choose which amendment they they want to protect, you know? There are some people who are strongly in favor of the Second Amendment, but not so concerned about the first. Some who care a lot about the first and not the fifth, and you know, it's all over the place. So I have, it's rare to come across people who say, I believe in every bit of the Constitution and every amendment and every part of the Bill of Rights. It often seems to be cherry-picked in in relation to their personal or you know professional interests you know like like i believe in this the others yeah well that's not here anymore but you know at some point in time i think a lot of us believed in all of the amendments you know everything that's in the constitution uh the way that it was written gosh darn it i my page reloaded and i lost my my uh notes here so first of all i think it's interesting how people pick and choose what they believe in many written texts. You know, you can say uh, someone is promoting a certain document or book or whatever, and then you find parts of it and say, well, what about this? And they say, well, you know, that, that doesn't count. It's only this part that we're looking at. Well, okay, that is what it is. The second thing that I think is interesting, let's see if I can get my notes back on here. Yeah, there we go. So the second thing that's interesting is he says, and I, I'm not certainly uh, against the Second Amendment, in any capacity. Uh, I think that uh, sensible gun control would would uh, certainly have a place in this day and age. And there's the obvious concern that once you start 
taking any part of or, or regulating anything to a certain extent, you know, that's where you start the slippery slope. And I, I understand that argument as well. So I'm not really picking a side on that right now. Uh, we definitely don't want people who aren't qualified. We don't want criminals walking around with guns, right? Uh, I think most of us would agree on that. Um, but this, this uh, Cody Wilson says that he's willing to accept the social costs. Now, I don't know what that means exactly, because when someone says, I'm willing to accept the consequences, that means that they fall on you. And when he says the social costs, I think that what he's talking about are people using 3D printable guns to commit crimes. You know, it's kind of like this comes with the territory. If you want to protect the Second Amendment, you have to understand that there will be guns used to commit crimes. So if he's saying that he accepts the social costs, I think that what he means is that society accepts the social costs. I don't think that he mean I, I don't think that he means that he's okay with people shooting at him with a 3D printable gun. I, I'm just curious as to what that means exactly. Because I heard a similar statement recently where someone said, you know, if innocent people end up being prosecuted in order to protect, uh, you know, victims of crimes, then that's the, that's the cost I'm willing to pay. And it's like, no, you're not paying the cost. The, the innocent people who are convicted are the ones who are paying that cost, not you. So that statement really isn't accurate. And I hope that that's not what he meant by this one. In any case, uh, he goes on to say, I literally believe in the Second Amendment to the point that it's all right and it should be expected there will be social costs for protecting a right like this. And so presumably social costs to other citizens uh, besides himself. 3D printed guns rose to the forefront last week when President Trump tweeted that he's looking into the concept, adding that it doesn't seem to make much sense. I don't understand this paragraph at all. Let, I, let me read that again and tell me if you can make anything out of this. 3D printed guns rose to the forefront last week when President Trump tweeted, he's looking into the concept. So he's looking into the concept and says that it doesn't make much sense. I'm not sure if that means that he doesn't think that it make much makes much sense to print a 3D gun. I, I, I'm not sure what that means exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it's quite vague. Uh, critics have warned that 3D printed guns can be made by individuals who would otherwise be prohibited from owning a fire, firearm and are untraceable. And one could easily argue that people who want to get firearms are obviously, you know, people that shouldn't have firearms that are going to want them can get them through other means, you know, other illegitimate means. So the idea, I think, being that we certainly don't want to make it easy for the wrong people to get 3D printable guns. And at the same time, depending on your interpretation of the Second Amendment, maybe it is your right in this day and age to be able to download and print a gun. I really don't know the answer to that, but I am curious to hear what other people think. Uh, good guy with guns stop bad guys with guns. There's a lot of data that says more guns equals less crime. I say give one to everyone and wait for the dust to settle. That might also solve some of our population problems, Nate. Uh, the interesting thing here about this, and again, I hope that you all stick with me on this. I believe that the most intelligent thing that we can do is to look at both sides of this argument. So uh, there's certainly a reason why the Constitution protects people's rights to bear arms. I, I'm with that completely. And by the way, I don't know if Wayne's on here today, but I watched that Ri uh, Ruby Ridge documentary last week. That was a trip. I, I want to come back to that in a minute if we have a little extra time here. And Nate... I, I agree that stopping a bad guy with a gun is not something you can do, you know, in most cases without a gun, right? That totally makes sense. And at the same time, we have to consider the implications, especially if, you know, I don't know if you saw in the news, but last week, a 78, I want to say it was 78 year old veteran who, sh who shot someone who broke into his house and started strangling his 11-year-old child inside of a bathtub in his home. This guy, who was a veteran of the Vietnam War, hit the guy over the head with the vase, broke the vase, the guy couldn't stop him that way, went and got his firearm, shot the dude, walked out into his living room, and was being told by law enforcement, you know, according to who, whose story you listen to, Supposedly, there were law enforcement officers outside of his home yelling at him to drop his gun. 
the the claim is they never identified themselves as police officers but more importantly because of his time during the vietnam war he had hearing loss to the point where he did not hear them say anything to him so he did not drop his gun he wasn't i, I don't believe he was aiming it at anyone but he was holding a gun so they shot him and now he's dead so is this a case, you know, this is a case of a good guy with a gun shooting a bad guy with a gun and then getting shot because he had a gun. And I, I think that this is the area where it gets confusing. You know, if you can imagine a room full of people with guns and law enforcement arrives and knows that there is a report of someone with a firearm and they see a whole bunch of people with guns, it's going to be difficult to know who should be holding the gun, you know, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So while, while I, I totally agree with the point that you cannot stop someone with a gun unless you have one yourself, how do we differentiate between who the get, good guys are and who the bad guys are? And that's not to mention the number of stray bullets that are flying around. I, I, at the very least, I think this is something that we need to figure out. You know, we need to understand and figure out how we prevent more guns from causing more damage, you know, unless we just want to just, you know, let it be the wild, wild west and everybody gets to shoot each other and, and the fastest gun survives, which uh, obviously that's not going to happen any, anymore. But um, when, when you hear about things like this, where people who are defending their own homes and they're inside on their own property indoors with a gun, and then they get shot by someone else outside who's supposed to be the good guy with the gun, it raises a lot of questions, you know, as to how those situations uh, even happen in the first place. Uh, the con Let's see. I wonder if these 3D printed guns can withstand the pressure of repeated use due to the high pressures released during the firing in the chamber. That is a good technical question that I have no idea uh, how that goes. You know, I've seen a pipe wrench 3D printed before and they were able to open up things with it and it seemed to be... They, they claimed that it was every bit as durable as a real pipe wrench. So I, I don't know. It's a good question, Greg. The Constitution's Second Amendment is to stop a tyrannical government. That's why we must keep it. Every dictator starts with taking the guns from the people. Absolutely agree. Uh, in addition to that, I, I think that we have to we have to hope that if there were a tyrannical government, that at least some of the people with the really big guns would be on our side. Because obviously the you know the military and the government and law enforcement have access to much much more quantity and much more quality and bigger firearms than the average citizen. So, um, yeah, easy fix, no guns, no deaths here in the UK. It's a mandatory five year prison sentence. Hey Dave, uh, I'm absolutely with strong. I, I I'm down for very strict prison sentences, very strict punishment for people who use guns in, you know, to commit a crime. Absolutely. I, I hopefully that would solve part of the problem. Uh, cops shouldn't have guns, nor any government official. Democide kills more people than anything else. Democide? I don't know that word. What is democide? I'm going to have to look that up. Democide. Uh, a term proposed by R.J. Rummel, who defined it as the intentional killing of an unarmed or disarmed person by government agents acting in their authoritative capacity and pursuant to government policy or high command. Well, thanks. I learned a new gun. A new gun. I learned a new word today. Interesting. Yeah, I'll probably get demonetized. This this video might uh, might not last. <laughs> we'll see. But I think it's an interesting topic at the very least. Uh, for owning a gun, five year min five year prison sentence. Yeah. Oh, for owning a gun. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's. It, it seems that you know, regardless of which side you're on in this argument, that I, I can remember. Um, I can remember presidents in the past kind of saying that yes. It would be nice to do something about gun control, but we are so far entrenched in gun culture at this time and people are adamant about preserving their right to bear arms. I, I don't think, I don't know that it will be realistic to ever eliminate guns. You know, if we decide, you know, if people voted on this and said, yeah, we don't want everyone to have guns, I doubt that that's going to go away at least at this point in time. And, you know, it obviously opens up a lot of other questions like what kind of gun? You know, should you be able to own a 50 cal? Should you be able to own a rocket launcher? Should you be able to own a sawed off shotgun? You know, there, there are all sorts of questions and, and not nearly enough time to discuss that here. And again, I probably couldn't have this topic for discussion on YouTube in the first place because they're just so goofy about uh, censoring or, you know, de demonetizing and de-ranking 
any type of videos that have to do with that. Like I said, I can't even put heat gun in my video description, but uh, the consensus seems to be that you cannot eliminate guns in American culture. And, and I think that, you know, at least for the time being, that's the way it's going to be. So the concern, of course, is how do we keep bad guys from using guns to do bad things? Don't know the answer to that one, but we probably don't want them to download and print guns. And at the same time, if they're not able to do that, I assume that they would get them through other means. You know the old saying, if guns are outlawed, then only outlaws will have guns. So I don't know. People are still dying in the UK. They just uh, they just use things like hammers and knives. People will kill with whatever they can use. Guns are not the problem. Yeah, and that you know that debate, I, I see both sides of it. Uh, there's there are many good arguments on either side, and it's kind of the problem with with a lot of the choices that we face nowadays is that there are extreme views on either side. So you can take this to either extreme, and it's diff difficult to reconcile at some point in the middle where we say, okay, here's what would make sense. Let's do this without taking anything away from anyone, but at the same time be able to save some lives. And I will say it's it's a bit odd that we've actually repealed a law that said that people who are mentally unfit cannot own firearms. To me, that's kind of a strange one to say that if you are mentally unstable, now it's okay for you to buy a gun. I, I don't understand the logic behind that one, but um, yeah, I, I'll probably leave that right there. And I think we maybe we should just do a, a, a conversation on this and who cares if it gets demonetized or not at some point. We'll come back to this one for sure. So the last one is is interesting and creepy and at the same time I want to preface this with uh, this is techstory.in so this could be a questionable news source but I've read this on many other outlets so I think that this is legitimate as far as I can tell and with what's going on in Bangladesh right now it it's it, anyways I, I'll, I'll leave that one also because that's going to open up another big can of worms uh, let me get the last comment here from Nate, though. The answer is to give all the good people guns. Ah, okay. If you knew everyone was packing and may be ready to snap at any moment, you'd be really nice to everyone. And I think they've got that in an open carry state, you know, much lower rates of violence when people know that there are guns on a lot of people's hips walking down the street. The question, I think, Nate, is who the good people are. So give all the good people guns. Who? How do we determine who the good people are? I think that's that's the open question there. Um, I don't know. I, obviously, when we have these types of issues that have been around forever, it, there's a reason why, and that is because no one has been able to come up with, with a solution that satisfies both sides. It, I don't know that it's even possible. So, supposedly, in China, they have launched high-tech bird drones to watch over their citizens I don't have a difficult time believing this. They've already been doing a lot of strange things along these same lines. Uh, supposedly, they banned the Winnie the Pooh movie because someone said that the bear in this animated movie looks like the president and nobody liked that and they were using it to make fun of him. So the movie was banned, which is strange. Uh, supposedly, they've launched these new birds, which they call Dove or Operation Dove or something like that. More than 30 Chinese military and government agencies have been reportedly using drones to make, uh, excuse me, to look like birds to surveil China's citizens in at least five provinces. This is according to the South China Morning Post Sunday, which is interesting because I, 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 for some reason, I would wonder if they're allowed to print this in their media at all. Codenamed Dove and run by Song Baifeng, a professor at Northwestern Polytechnical University, University in Xi'an. I hope that I said that correctly. These bird drones mimic the flapping wings of a real bird, so they're meant to blend in. Not just like drones flying around watching you. It's like, oh, is that a bird? Is it a drone? We don't know. But it has a high-definition camera, GPS antenna, flight control system, and data, excuse me, and data link with satellite communication capability. So if this is real, this is freaky, like I said, Talk about feeling like we're living in a science fiction movie. And of course, the question is, if they're doing this already in China, how long will it take to reach other parts of the world if it hasn't already? And pretty soon when you walk outside, you don't have to worry about people pointing a camera at you because there are cameras installed on every street light that you walk by. Every business has a, you know, an outside facing camera. And pretty soon you have drones and fake birds flying around, taking pictures and... Uh, how weird is this? It also employs facial... Oh, so, excuse me. So, at, 
in uh, reference to China in general, stepping up their surveillance game, they already, according to this article, employ facial recognition, artificial intelligence, smart glasses, and other technologies to monitor 1.4 billion citizens with the aim of one day giving each of them a personal score based on how they behave. So we talked about this social, um, what do they call it again? This, this, not social media, but this social currency. Like you get to earn points and depending on how high your rating is, you have access to privileges and certain financial services and even public transportation. And some people would be aced out of this because they're, sorry, your rating's too low. You don't have access to this area anymore, which is pretty weird. Uh, the good people are the ones not using their gun to hurt someone else. Fair enough. That's most of us. And, and I would agree. Idaho has passed laws now that anyone over 18 can conceal carry without a permit. We have very little crime. Interesting. Here's a question for you. How old do you have to be to drink alcohol in Idaho? Just wondering, because I'm pretty sure it's 21. And this is the one that has always got me on this. Being able to own a firearm at 18, but not consume alcohol until you're 21. You can vote when you're 18. Uh, you can't become president until you're 35. So we have all these different age restrictions and limitations, depending on what it is that you're talking about. To me, that's that's intriguing. You know, why is it okay to join the military and go and shoot a gun at people? You know, have a license to kill, so to speak, during a uh, during a combat situation. And yet, even on base, I believe nowadays, you're not allowed to have access or to consume alcohol until you're age 21. It used to be 18 on base, and I think that they changed that in recent years. 21 to drink. I think the concealed carry is 21, uh, also not 18. Again, you know, same question though. If you're old enough to own a firearm responsibly at 18, why would you have to be 21 to have a concealed carry permit? I, I don't, you know, I don't get like where they came up with these different numbers. And, you know, whether they're too high or too low, it's interesting that we have them kind of all over the board, just depending on what it is that you're talking about. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with an idea here that I think will be interesting and probably not popular with YouTube, but I think that, I think that a lot of people would be interesting, interested in seeing this debate maybe presented, you know, professionally, not where people are screaming at each other, but having conversations about these topics and it probably wouldn't do a lot of good for my YouTube channel, but I think it would be interesting to entertain just, just to have a discussion about this handgun versus long gun. What? Um, what does that mean? Handgun versus long gun. Hey, thanks for using democide. I've never heard that term before. So I learned something today and RJ Rummel. Uh, I was thinking Rummel who's RJ Rummel intentional killing of an unarmed or disarmed person by government agents democide wow okay i had not heard that anyhow uh wayne last week had suggested that i check out the uh assault at ruby ridge documentary that was interest interesting one or another interesting one i should say if you guys haven't seen that you should check it out there is a dramatized version there's actually a movie about it so i want to watch that but i prefer to see the documentary uh, obviously, if there's a book out there, it's probably even better than the documentary, but we only have so much time for reading. Uh, handgun versus long gun is, is the age difference. Interesting. So if you're 18, you can use a long gun, I would assume, and then handgun when you're 21. Yeah, and you're up there in, you're pretty close to that, right, Nate? Because I think you told me you're in northern Idaho area. Man, that was just a bad situation all the way around. I had... I think I kind of recognize that name, Ruby Ridge, but I didn't know any of the details. And watch that documentary that uh, Wayne had put, he had posted on last week's live stream. And man, talk about a huge, hot pile of mess. That thing was just handled wrong in so many different, uh, at so many different levels. Uh, really, truly a tragic story. I, well, I don't want to get, I was going to say here's what happened in the end, but you, I don't want to ruin it if anyone's interested in checking that out. All right, so... That was pretty much it. Yeah, I, I kind of figured that that the whole gun debate is probably going to be um, something worth talking about. And again, very challenging because YouTube doesn't like it. Maybe we should call it something else, but then no one would find it. So I really don't know how to navigate around uh, around SEO and be able to discuss controversial topics because I think there are a lot of important ones out there. 
and definitely some room for people to to un at least understand both sides of an argument and try to make some sense out of it, but it's kind of tough to do here on YouTube. At the time it happened, I lived about 15 miles from the house. Are you kidding me? You were 15 miles from the location in Ruby Ridge, so you saw all the block the roadblocks and the um, and the FBI coming in and out of there. Man, that must have been crazy. I can only imagine. Hey, no Harvey today. Where is Harvey and Wayne Taylor? I didn't see him on here. Anyways, friends, that's uh, pretty much it for today. Uh, let's see, what else do we have going on? Hey, have any of you removed and replaced a Wi-Fi IC on an iPad Mini 3? Because I think that's what I'm probably going to have to end up doing, and it doesn't look like fun. That thing is underfilled all over the place. So um, if you have any suggestions, I saw one video on YouTube, and it didn't really answer a lot of my questions. It was one of those videos with a bunch of music in the background, so... So not a lot of info, just a lot of video. All the choppers literally were just above the treetops right over our house. Wow, that is crazy, man. How, ah, man, what a, that, it's just mind blowing that something like that even can happen, you know, in as recent as it was on the way there. Yep, so that is, that is pretty much it for me. I'm going to hang out in the chat for a minute and then I'll go back to work also. It's money for me too. Thank you everyone for joining me today and for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the live stream, please hit that little thumbs up button down on the bottom, leave a comment, share it with your friends, or uh, bring some topics for next week, next week for us to discuss. I think I've, I think I've got a few ideas coming up. Also, uh, next week I'm actually doing phone repair training Tuesday through Friday. So I'm questioning when and how next Thursday's live stream is going to happen because I'm actually going to be on site doing training if I have sufficient internet speed, I will probably do it from the training facility. And if not, I don't know. Maybe I'll uh, do it a little later in the day or the evening or something like that. So just a heads up, next Thursday's live stream, I'm kind of up in the air on how that's going to work. I definitely want to live stream. I just don't know uh, if it's going to be at the usual time. So I'll certainly keep everyone updated on that. Uh, thanks, Nate. Thanks, everyone, for your participation. Uh, good stuff on the way. I just... Probably after next week, I've got to get that training knocked out, and then I'm going to be adding a few things to the channel here. So hopefully you'll enjoy. Thanks for watching. Talk to you next time.